seated. You know, I, my wife said, Bill, I kind of admire you on this meeting going down to Texas where all that nice weather is. And a while ago, I called her. I said, how cold is it? She said, it's not very cold. It's just about zero. But what you all doing down there? I said, just raining and sleeping as hard as I can. <laughs> I said, the summer must have went on west to take its vacation. <laughs> it sure left the... The lower part of Texas hasn't. I see we've got a slick, rainy ride tomorrow. And uh, so we uh, solicit your prayers. And uh, I didn't expect to be anybody out. I thought all Texans is afraid of bad weather, but I see some of them are not. <laughs> so we are happy that you're here tonight and happy that we had this. You showed us this great, fine meeting. One of the nicest meetings we've had in years. Your fine spirit and cooperation. I want to thank these pastors, each and every one of them, for your fine cooperation. I didn't get to eat dinner with you, just had a breakfast with you all, but I'd like to go over and see how your wife can cook grits and biscuits. And I thought, oh, my, I imagine would be fine. Be damned. I appreciate our little organist here. It's been so sweet helping us. All you people, and they tell me that they give a love <coughs> offering in the, for, the, for me. All the expenses are made, brother? Yes, sir. If it isn't, turn it right in on that, see? Yeah, right. And if uh, everything's all right and there's no particular need of it, I'll put it in the work of the Lord as I travel on. May God ever bless you. And I believe it's said in the Scripture, in so much as you have done it the least of my little ones, you have did it to me, so... I am that least one, so you have did it unto him. You did. I know it's a portion of your living you're sharing with me for the gospel. I pray that God will so richly bless you. And when life is finished here at the other side, you'll be rewarded. If not, you're a hundredfold here and eternal life on the other side. Your faith has been tremendous. How you have got together and pressed your faith on land in your faith if it wasn't for that faith the meeting would not have been what it is but it's because that you have believed and believe with me and I, I appreciate it I told my brethren and told the friends that's called me up from different parts of the country that it was tremendous how the, the people here in Beaumont had certainly put their faith and prayer behind the meeting and helped there's no doubt for what everything when it makes a little a little history or does something unusual, you have the pro and con of it. You have the, the good and the bad. You have to have the night to enjoy the day. You have to have bad weather to enjoy good weather. That's the way life is. You have to have bad people to make the good people show up. And so you have to have a false to make a real. I'm not saying this because I was asked to say it. I'm saying it because it's out of my heart. And I want to say to you, all you people, you uh, churches, I wouldn't want you to think that I was a, a person that tried to disagree with all churches and they're all wrong and I'm the ones right. If I've left that impression, forgive me. I didn't mean it like that. But I meant to say that there's not an organization in the world, I don't believe, of Christian religion or what's got good people in it. And they've got God's people in it. I do not agree with organization, uh, because if the organization, now listen close, if the organization say, we believe this, with a comma, all right, but if we believe this, period, that's all wrong. Amen. The, if you end your doctrine with a comma, we believe this plus as much as God wants to add to it, but when you say we believe this, period, and that's all, then you shut God right out of it. Right. And that's what organizations do. They end it with a, with a period. Now, such things take place. One of our brethren, because that he had prayed for years, and he had prayed for me to come here. And I want to tell you how the Lord worked. I had a great stacks of invitations worldwide. I put all my American revivals together and then my foreign overseas. The first of every year, I start Christmas week and we pray for it the week through because we're usually home then. And, uh, and so we pray for it. 
And immediately my mind was attracted to Texas, Houston. Oh, not Houston, but Beaumont. And then in, I said, you got anything from Beaumont? The secretary brought out invitations, several of them. And I said, let's see. And I just picked up one like that, laid it, picked out one. And I seen this little pastor's name. I said, contact him. Just contact brother. And then the brother with good intentions, with no ill feelings, and if some of the state men are here, presbyters or whatever it is, brethren, don't do something evil. You should be sorry of later. And they, be a Christian. Be a gentleman. The little brother meant no harm. He was only trying to follow out and was thankful for a prayer being answered. That's all, but just being thankful for God answering his prayer. He didn't mean to be evil, and he, I don't think he is. He's a good brother, fine, sweet brother. And then when his good brother, one of the, he belongs to UPC, which is called, among the people, oneness, and uh, some of the Trinitarian believing brethren come in. His heart's hungry for fellowship. And when his Trinitarian brother came, what was it? Nothing to do but put an arm around him. Now, brother, if you excommunicate a man from your assemblies for such as that, God have mercy on your sinful soul. When I get to a place or any organization that can't reach its arms out and get a brother from anywhere, God be merciful to you. Assembly brethren, and you, a Church of God, four square, and all of you, I'm sure you can appreciate a stand that a gallant brother would take like that. That's right. I'm sure that you, assembly brother, appreciate that. You four square in Church of God and Trinitarian believing brother. This brother reached out his heart. He didn't have the heart to say stay away because he loves you. Now, while he's in his heart when he's down, having to grind hard, he's relied upon that all the time. If anything should happen, then the brethren should put him out of the organization because he fellowship with you. Remember that. Have fellowship one with another and forget your little differences and be brothers one with another and strengthen him. Lend him a hand. Pat him on the back. Come on, brother. We're right together. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. You'll find out one thing, brother. Criticism will only get you in trouble. That's right. Don't never down anybody. Lift them up. I want to tell a little story about this. This comes on my mind. There's not many here tonight, so we got a good time to speak. We'll pray for the sick. Give my little farewell message to you. And I would like to say that here some time ago I was in Ohio. We were having a great meeting. It's been about four or five years ago, maybe six. And the meeting got so heavy until I had to move out into the country, the little motel I stayed in, so many was around their hotel, brother. I moved out into the country. I've been fasting for something special to happen, as something that would win the hearts of the people. You know, sometimes when we are praying for others, we're the one who gets the help many times when you're praying for others. Like at nighttime when I say, put your hands on one another. Don't pray for yourself, but pray for the other fellow. He's praying for you. The Bible said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for the other. That's the way we want to do. Let the Baptists pray for the Methodists, and the Methodists pray for the Baptists, and the Oneness pray for the Twoness, the Twoness pray for the Twoness and Threeness and Fourness and whatever more comes along. Everybody pray one for another. Amen. That our faith won't fail. And that one glorious one that we all love, Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, so I moved out into the country about three miles out of the city. And um, so we would have been having dinner over at a little Dunkard restaurant where the, I believe the Mennonite. And um, they were a fine bunch of people that believes in holiness. And them little ladies dressed just as nicely and godly with their little, their clothes hanging nice on them and long hair and clean as a pin. I just love to eat there. And they were attending my meeting, and uh, we just had a wonderful time. So on Sunday, they closed the little place up. It was at the meeting, and especially on Sunday, they didn't run it. So I've been fasting for about two or three days, and I was just going to preach that afternoon. I thought, well, it seems like you never want to fast until you're led to fast. Then if you get hungry, it's time to eat. 
Afterwards, Jesus was afterwards in hunger. Some of this thing is people fasting and say, I'm going to fast 40 days and the false teeth falling out and losing weight. And My, you better stop that. That's right. You wait till God leads you to do that on those things. Be led of the Spirit. I've had people, after a certain book was wrote and put out about fasting, people come to my line, women, pregnant, and things like that, come in my mind, lose your, lose your mind, come go in the insane institution from that. See, of course, you can't do that. Just because somebody else does it, that's no science you're supposed to do it. That's right. Let God lead you to do what you're doing. You're led to, when you get hungry, it's time to eat. When God puts a fast on it, you don't get hungry. It's God being in it. Jesus was afterwards in hunger. See, after his fast was over, he hungered. But so, however, this, uh, let that, that you just judge that by yourself. I'm, your pastor's a more apt, better position to tell you those things. If I said wrong or forgive me. But however, I've been fasting for a couple of days or three, which is about as long as I can ever fast because I'm on the move so much. So then, uh, I thought, well, I'm just going to preach this afternoon, so I'll just um, um, I'll go over and get me a sandwich. And I thought, oh, oh, they're cold. Well, over across the way was a just a regular little old common American restaurant, typical. Well, I just slipped over there while they were down making the preliminaries. I thought I'll just get me a hamburger and that'll kind of press out the wrinkles till I can uh, tonight. I'll eat after service. So then I got my went over to get a hamburger and I walked into place. And when I walked in the place, the very atmosphere, you could tell you wasn't amongst them believers. Over to the left was some slot machines. And a policeman standing there with it, about my age with his arm around a woman playing a slot machine. Now, gambling's illegal in Ohio. And there he was playing a slot machine, a man that was supposed to uphold the law, breaking the law. And a man that was supposed to be a I set an example of morals and things, and with his arm around a woman where he ought not to have, and the man my age, well, he, I guess he was married and had a family. I don't know. Then I thought, my goodness. I looked back, and there was a table, a bunch of these boys, and motorcycle guys with that duck-looking haircut, and motorcycle jackets, and overhauls pulled down on their hips, or and he, they need a real good old-fashioned southern daddy with a... A hickory with the Ten Commandments on the end of it. That's exactly what they mean. You folks, what's happened to the American people? You know what? They call juvenile delinquency. I think it's parent delinquency. That, that's exactly right. Spare the rod, you spoil your son. That's what Scripture says. And there they were sitting back there, and a young lady, pretty young girl, and... One boy standing there, kind of a leader of the pack, with his boots set up on the table, uh, and uh, his arm around that young lady, where it was in very ungodly around her hips like that, and hugging this waitress up to his arm. Well, I stood there, I thought, my goodness. I looked over on this side, and there sat an old grandma, about as old as my grandmother, and she, poor old thing, had on these a tights or shorts or what you call it, and she had poor old arms, flabby flesh, and she had her toenails painted the same color of her lips, and a great big black spots under her, her eyes or where she painted some kind of stuff, and her hair was colored blue. Now, you know human beings don't hardly have that greenish looking blue, so I thought, well, poor old thing, maybe that's all right, so maybe she likes that. But I looked, and she was with two old guys, and they were drunk. And one of them, right there in the summertime, had a big old army overcoat on with a big scarf wrapped around his neck. <laughs> and they had beer sitting on the table. I thought, oh, I wouldn't eat in here for nothing. So I thought, God, how can you, being holy, look at such a thing? I thought, is my little Sarah and Rebecca going to have to come up under such stuff as that as Americans? My two little girls that I'm trying to raise for God to be missionaries or pianists or something, maybe marry a little preacher that'll help him in the work of the Lord, try to raise them clean and righteous girls, make real women, and they have to come up under such atmospheres as that. I said, Father, with the spirit that I got, that you give me, my spirit being sanctified by your blood of your son, and that looks evil to me. 
How can you stand to look at it? Why don't you just smite the thing and swipe it off the earth? My righteous indignation might arose, see. We don't want to say it was temper, but it was just something. It was a, uh, the same kind of indignation Jesus had when he looked upon him with anger and beat him out of the temple, you see. And um, so I looked around, and I seen all that, and I thought, and my little Sarah Rebecca's going to have to come up under her. God looks like, if you're holy and how great you are, look like you just blow the thing off the map like that. How could you stand it? I thought, oh my, and I felt something, what, like a whipping. That's the way that light, when it comes up, it's whipping like a fire. And I noticed it was standing close to me. I stepped back behind the door. I put my head against the wall and I said, Heavenly Father, what, I thought, now here's what I was thinking, do you want me to call down judgment? That just shows how you a human being can get so far away. I stepped back, I thought he was going to ask me to just go out there and say, all you, I rebuke you, everyone, you sinners. Repent or die. See? And I thought that's what he'd tell me to do. I wouldn't do it unless he told me. So I, I went out, went back there, and I thought he's going to show me. And when I did, I seen look like, when I opened my eyes, after I know he was in the, behind the door there with me, and it looked like uh, something turning. I began to look at it. It was a world, this earth. And all around it was a mist, like a red mist blowing all around. I looked far up above there and I seen him. Then I looked down and I saw myself. Looked like I come right onto the earth. And everything that I would do was mean. My sin would start up to meet God. And before it could get to him, Jesus act like a bumper on a car between me and God. See? It hit him and he'd hold his side. The tears would run out of his eyes and... I hear him say, Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. I watch myself as a little boy, the things that I've done. And I'd see every time I do something evil, why, well, look like it was start up and God would have killed me for it. And I, because he's holy. Sin cannot stand in his presence. But I've seen that mist blowing around. And it, that blood of Jesus act like a bumper between me and being slain by God. Well, I looked, got up close to where he was at, and I looked, and there lay my book laying out before him. And on there was my name, and every bad thing that I'd ever done was wrote right on it. And I noticed every time that I'd do something wrong, be I'd done it, it, it'd catch it, and it, it'd hurt him, it'd catch his breath like, and tears would run down his cheeks, and he'd say, forgive him, he doesn't know what he's doing. I thought, Lord, did I make you suffer like that? Oh, Lord, I love you. Would I make you suffer like that? You mean my sins did that? He nodded his head to me, and I could see that. Look like you see him in the picture of that crown on him like that, blood in his eyes and face. He looked at me, and it looked like tears all matted his beard together, blood stains all over his face. I said, did my sins do that to you? He nodded his head to me. I said, God, forgive me. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to hurt you like that, Lord. I love you with all my heart. He took his side, had it with his hand, took his finger like this, and wrote on my old dirty book, Pardon. Tuck it and throw it over behind him like this into the sea of forgetfulness, laid out a new book. I said, Lord, I thank you. I I'll never try to do anything wrong you He said, Now I, I freely forgave you. I freely forgave you. And then you want to destroy her. And when that time, the door had come back and I was looking right at the woman sitting there. I wanted to destroy her after I was freely forgiven. I just pulled the door back together where I'd been moving my arms while the vision was on. I pulled the door back up and I said, Father, forgive me. I, I'll go right to her and I'll apologize. I stepped out the door one of those old man drunk sitting there with her said, you think the rain will hurt the rhubarb? And got up to excuse themselves and walked out to the restroom. I kind of strolled over that way, and this policeman still playing the slot machine. I walked over kind of where she was at. I said, how do you do? Poor old thing looked up and said, oh, hello. And I said, could I sit down? She said, thank you, I have company. I said, I didn't mean it like that. I said, I just want to say a word to you. I want you to ask you, I want to ask you to forgive me. What'd you ever do to me? 
I said, will you wait just a minute and let me tell you? He said, yes. I said, I stood in the door and I told her the story. I said, right back behind there, he showed me where I was wrong. She looked up and looked like it sobered her. She looked up, she said, are you Brother Brandon? I said, I am. She said, you're that minister down here? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I'm ashamed you to see me like this. And I said, will you forgive me? She said, certainly. She said, sit down. I said, thank you. And I sat down at the little booth with her. And she said, I want to tell you something, Brother Branham. She said, I passed by and seen your meetings. I seen it advertised and I went in. She said, I'm simply ashamed of myself. She said, what would you believe if I told you that my father was a Methodist minister? So I got two daughters, both of them are Sunday school teachers. I said, what happened? She told me about a, a letter from her husband, and he ran off with another woman. She started in drinking and started off. And she said, I know I'm, I'm past redemption, strictly a legal issue. And I said, that I'm past redemption. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. She started crying. She said, Brother Bram, you think I'm not past redemption? I said, why did he say that to me then a few minutes ago? I took her by the hand, knelt down there on the floor, and there she gave her life to Jesus Christ. You talk about slot machine stopping and everything else. Everybody there was crying and praying. She got up, went out to go home. A new life. See, God showed me that my own heart wasn't right because I was trying to condemn her and not looking at what I come from, too. So if we can always remember, look back to the pit where we was hewed from. Things will look a lot different. We don't want to condemn no one. Love everybody. Whenever you lose that real genuine love that's in your heart, you've lost everything. Just don't never forget that. That when you lose love, it's all gone. Now, remember that. The love this little brother had for all of you. And remember the love of the brethren here. Brethren, whatever you do, I'm not saying all you organizations break up and make one organization. It'll never be that way. You'll never do it. You'll just go through life just the same old thing, banging and fussing and stewing. That's wrong. Amen. Keep your organization. Stay in it if you can. That's all right. But reach out an arm and love everybody else and have respect. Give him a little blanket too because he wants to get covered all the way. It's best far enough for all of us. Room, room, there's plenty of room. There's room at the top and for you. There's room for all of us. And just remember that. If I could see every Pentecostal church, the four square, open Bible standard, Pentecostal Assemblies of God, United Pentecostal Church, and all the rest of them, put their arms around one another and forget their differences, just fellowship one with another, I'd say, let thy servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation in the church. And as long as Satan's got you shooting at one another, he just steps back and takes a vacation. He don't have to fool at all. See, you're, see, I pray that I live to see the day. And if you don't do it within yourselves, some kind of a persecution will hit this nation one of these days. You'll long for one another then. Brothers, the life precious faith. So why go through the punishment when we can have a little piece of heaven on earth right now? God be with you. I want to come back. I heard you ask and said, for me, want me to come back? I'll come back someday, the Lord willing. I'd like to bring a tent and set it up out here somewhere and right in between the cities around here and let us all come together and have fellowship one with another. Try to build up the churches. Every one of you has got something to do now. Every one of you get right in your church and work just as hard as you can for your local church. See? But don't never criticize. If you know something bad about the other side, don't say nothing about it. See? Keep that to yourself. The enemy is listening to hear that. See? Don't let him know nothing. Don't speak nothing out and he won't know nothing about it. See? Keep it to yourself and pray. Say, well, the poor brother did wrong, but don't down him. He's down anyhow. Try to pick him up. See? Lift him up. Be the good Samaritan. See? Try to pick him up. If you can't even talk to him, pray for him until it is that way. Just keep him on your heart because his soul's worth 10,000 worlds. Now let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we want to bow to give thanks to you for this great people down here, your servants, I thank you for 
Brother King, Brother Petty, for all the rest of them, Lord, these fine brothers, these wonderful sisters, their churches, their, their members, and for those great people in the city, to the business places, how they've been so nice. We thank you for this auditorium, for this, this uh, people that let us have it. God, have they always stowed their doors open everywhere for me when rains and storms and things. God, may they live to the coming of the Lord. Grant it. Bless the custodians, all the members of the lodge, all. May they all find rest and peace in Christ. Grant it, Lord. Bless these fine policemen that's been watching the yards out here. That little fellow the other night that come out and looked over at me and said that wonderful compliment. Father, I was almost out then, just dropping out from the anointing to being. I didn't have a chance to say much to him. If that boy isn't saved and how he compliments he said about the meeting, I pray God that he'll receive the Holy Ghost. Granted, yes, yes. being glory. If I never see him on earth again, may I be able to shake his hand. A man like that would make uh, any city a good policeman. This little fellow I talked to at the door just a while ago. God bless that man. We just thank you for everything, Lord. You're so good to us. We pray now that you'll continue to bless us as we travel on towards the West Coast. I pray that you'll bless Brother King now as we talk to him troubles, and we pray that you'll be with him and all the other brothers. And God, the only one thing I can do, it's, it, a human being couldn't do it, but may your Holy Spirit constantly bind these hearts together of these people until they are one in Christ Jesus, granted, Father. Give us a great service tonight. Many of them has come over slick roads and, and out in this rain and storm. To get here tonight, to hear the closing service, I pray that you will bless them. May there not be a feeble person in our midst tonight. I ask that, Father, for your glory. May the power of the Holy Ghost come in tonight and give the exceeding abundant above all that we could even do or think. Further, we wait on you. In Jesus' name, speak to us. Amen. All the little parcels in here, we can pick them up as soon as we are... Uh, I pray over them. I want to wait till the anointing of the uh, Holy Spirit comes up on me to pray for the sick. Now, over in um, the book of Jeremiah, the 22nd verse, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why, then, is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? I want to take the subject in closing tonight of asking the question as God did, why? Now I hope we won't be long, 20, 30 minutes, and then we can pray for the sick. Why? If God makes a preparation or a place of escape, and then the people fail to walk in it, God's got a right to ask why. Amen. Don't you believe that? Yes. He's got a right to ask why. If uh, you're not condemned because uh, you are a sinner, you're uh, condemned because you don't accept Jesus as your Savior. Now, God would be unjust to condemn you and not make a prep preparation for you to come out of it because you were born in sin shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. No matter who your parents was or what they were, you're still just a sinner as any other child. When you're born in this world, we're all born in sin. We could not save ourselves. We could no more save ourselves than we could take our bootstraps and lift ourselves over the moon. We could not do it. We're totally helpless. And therefore, God would not condemn you on those bases because you are a sinner. He condemn you because you refuse to take the way of escape. So therefore, it isn't God, it's yourself. You condemn yourself. And when you condemn yourself, there's nobody to pity but yourself. 
That's all. We're, you, you must pity yourself because you haven't accepted God's provided way of escape. Now, when God makes these ways, just wonder why he feels. When he makes a way for us, for our healing, for our salvation, for our comfort, for our peace, and all these things, and we just walk away and leave them. It must make him feel terribly bad. So, one time in the Bible, over in the book of Second Kings, there was uh, a king who was a king of, uh, of Judah, and he, uh, his name was Ahaz, and he was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. He succeeded his father Ahab to the throne. After Ahab, that borderline believer, renegade to the gospel, lukewarm church member, went over and married a pagan girl to strengthen his kingdom, brought in idolatry into Israel, and oh, what a horrible thing he done. And then his little pagan wife took the life of precious Naboth in order that the king could take his inheritance. And that prophet prophesied what would happen to him and what would happen to her. The dogs would eat her in the street and would lick the blood of Ahab off of his chariot, and that's just exactly what happened. Amen. I can think of the time when Jehoshaphat, a man of God, when he really should have, have not associated in the wrong company. A believer hasn't got any fellowship with unbelievers. Amen. A crow and a dove cannot talk together. Amen. A crow eat on an old dead carcass. A dove is one bird without a gall. If it eat that dead carcass, it'd kill it. It's a special built bird, a, a dove is. A dove only eats grain. He has no gall. He could not digest it. So is a Christian. Has no gall of bitterness in him. They cannot eat the things of the world. Amen. A crow can eat the things wheat, and he can also eat carcass. He's a hypocrite. Yes. And a dove, I want to tell you something. A dove does not have to find water for a bath. Did you ever pick up a little dove? Rub your hand over him. He's oily. There's something from the inside comes out and keeps him clean. Oh. Wow. His body is oil from the oil from the inside coming out. Amen. I don't want to get started on that and get on the subject. But he keeps his body, his feathers, his garments clean by an inside oil. Every time he works his body, that works up and down his feathers and keeps him perpetually all the time clean. Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ sanctifies the believer day and night. And Ahab went out and had some fellowship with Jehoshaphat, or Jehoshaphat of Ahab, and he, whenever you see some of the unbelieving world, would you come out to our little card party, dear? Be careful. Well, you know, you work here and your boss wants you, we're just going to have a few little social things tonight. Stay away from it. Amen. Get away from it. Well, it's Christmas. you got a right to have a little clean fun. Don't you believe that? That's right. Stay away from it. Shun the very appearance of evil. Amen. Stay out of it. But Jehoshaphat weakened and went out to see Ahab, and Ahab had a purpose. He said, well, we got some land up here. It belongs to us. They showed him all the great things, and that's the way the devil does. Show you all the great things that he's got. See? All what he's got. Well, the glitter, the gold kind of... Brightened his eyes up, you know, and he thought, my, it didn't brighten him up, it dulled him up. And so, finally they sat out there and he said, well, we go up to Ramoth Gilead or shall I for draw it? He said, we ought to consult the Lord about this. So Ahab said, oh, of course so. Mm -hmm. We should do it. I've got the best ecclesiastical system there is in the country. He goes down to his seminary and draws out 400 prophets. Right. Fine, dressed, and collars turned around. And, oh, they were wonderful, man. Yes. Every one of them, ecclesiastical, theologians, right to the dock. Said, all right, gentlemen, 
You're well fed and taken care of, but uh, this great thing, now I'll tell you what I want you to do. Prophesy unto me and tell me whether we should go to Ramoth Gilead. See how great my robes are and what a great bishop I am. And here's also Bishop showing so from up here at the other kingdom. We're going to join forces together. You know, we'll be united then. <laughs> so we'll do great things, you know. Yeah. So one of them even built himself a pair of horns and began to run through the audience and he's pushing all the Syrians back. All the country belongs to us. And so uh, you're going to win by this. You know, there's something about a believer. If he ever was in contact with Christ, he just can't go for that kind of stuff. Amen. Yet old Jehoshaphat sitting up there, he said, isn't there just one more? <laughs> One more? Why, here's 400 of the highest educated, best men there is in the country, and they're prophets. Why would we ask for one more? Each one of them's got a DLD, PhD, double LQST. Why, they're my. You couldn't ask for more degrees. My, they know the scripture inside out, backwards and forwards. Joseph said, but, you know, I got a little funny feeling. I wish we had just into just one more. Oh, he said, yes, but he's a holy ruler. And his name's Micah, the son of Imlan, but said, I hate him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so Joshua thought, that, that sounds like a meal ticket. <laughs> so uh, don't let the king say so, but I'd like to hear what he says. So a runner went up there to the little shack where he's at, the little assembly somewhere up on the corner, you know, and he said, oh, Micah, you know what? You must, I've got to put a bug in here now, see. You say the same thing that they say. You say just like they say, because I tell you that uh, all 400 of them ecclesiastics is saying we should, we should do it this way, so you must say the same thing. Micah said, as the Lord God lives, I'll just say what he puts in my mouth. Amen. I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. So they brought him out. Ahab is having a raging spell. Get that holy roller among us down here to ruin our congregation as sure as the world. So then, first thing you know when he come up, he said, I'm warning you, he isn't going to say nothing but evil about me because I know he's always digging me about my women bobbing their hair and all these things. Oh, he's a holy roller, right? Uh, he said, I'm going to stay right with the word. Oh. So, he said, Micah, shall I go up to Ramoth Gilead and take the thing that belongs to me or shall I forbear? He said, give me tonight, let me see what the Lord will say. So after night passed, he come back and said, what do you say? He said, go on up. You want to? He said, how long will I adjure you? He knows there's something wrong with that. That you only tell me the truth. He said, go on up. He said, but I saw Israel like sheep scattered with no shepherd. <laughs> and he said, why? He was staying with the word of God. Amen. He is saying the same thing the word said. Because the word of God was with the prophet. And the prophet Elijah said he couldn't prophesy good against a man who was evil as Ahab. So the prophet, the word had done, said that Ahab was going to be killed. Jezebel was going to be fed to the dogs. And so what can Micah say any different than what the word said? Right. God, he had to stay with the word. No matter how great it sounds and how big it sounds, watch the word. Amen. That's always truth. And so there this great... State presbyter, bishop, and what it was, smacked him in the mouth and said, Which way went the word of God out of me if it went to you? He said, You'll see someday. He said, I saw God sitting on the throne. All the host of heaven was around him. And he said, Who can we get to go down and deceive Ahab to get him out there to make Elijah's prophecy come true? God watches over that, you know. He said, Who can I get to go out there? And a lion spirit come up and down probably hell. Come up and stood before him and said, I'll go down and get them preachers and make them everyone prophesy a lie. God's word's going to be fulfilled, brother. I don't care what takes place. John said, God's able these stones to rise children to Abraham. God's word. The son of that man had taken his throne after his death. One day walking out there, he had still hated them prophets. And he walked out there one day in his lattice and was looking around and he fell through the lattice and he got hurt. The Bible said he was sick. So he called some of his men and sent two of them, or a little company of soldiers, over to Akron, over to consult the prophets of Balaam. 
whether he was to get well or not. So you know God makes his secrets known to his prophets. Amen. Is that right? Amen. So Elijah down there in the mountain back in a cave laying on a pile, pile of brush or something back there, his coat laying over it, the Lord spoke to him, and he went up there and stood in the road. He said, go up there. Stand there because we're going up. Oh, are these soldiers passed around the corner. They look, coming, strolling down the road, coming old, fuzzy-looking preacher, beard all out over his face, and a big piece of leather wrapped around him. He wasn't very much to look at, but he had, Thus saith the Lord. Amen. That's the main thing. One's a classic. So he stopped him. He said, Why are you going over there to Acorn? He said, Go tell him. Why did he stand over there? Is it because there is no God in Israel? Is there no prophet here to consult? If he won't know something about it, why didn't he ask God? He's supposed to be the king here of Israel. So why didn't he ask God? Is it because we haven't got a God here? Is it because we haven't got no, uh, no uh, prophet down here? But because he's done this, go tell him, Thus saith the Lord, he's not coming off of that bed. Oh, my I wonder today, why does man want to smoke cigarettes? Why does people want to stay home on Wednesday night and watch a television program instead of going to prayer meeting? Why is it we want to do that? Because there's no joy in the house of the Lord? What makes the person want to, to drink and run around and act like that? Is it because we don't have any God? Is it because there's no joy in the house of the Lord anymore? Is it because the Holy Spirit isn't ready to bless all of us? Is, it, is there anything wrong with it? But because that we do it, that's the reason we're cursed. That's the reason God put this thing upon the church, this cold and dampness. We're going to other places for pleasure instead of coming to the house of the Lord for pleasure. The house of the Lord is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is the joy of His people. He wants you to come to church and worship Him and be happy and satisfied, giving praise and honor and glory and wisdom and might and power to God. He wants you to do that. And now, you know when these messengers got back and so they found, went into this king and they said, a man sent us back and told us such and such a thing. He said, who was he? How was he dressed? said he was hairy all over and had a piece of leather around his loins. And he said, that was the Elijah, the prophet of God, the Tishbite. Oh, my. He knew what was coming. It wasn't because they didn't have a God. It wasn't because they didn't have a prophet. But it was, a, it was the king's own stupid ways. It was his own selfish and ungodly acts like his mom and papa. He hated that prophet. That's the reason today that judgment rests upon the world. It's not because we haven't got a God, not because we haven't got prophets, but it's because that the people hate the ways of the Lord and love the ways of the world. Amen. Exactly right. Amen. It's just like a man, a patient, dying on a doctor's doorstep because he refuses to take his medicine. It's the same thing. He dies on the doctor's doorstep with enough medicine inside for his case, but he refuses to take it. That's not the doctor's fault. It's not the serum's fault. It's the man's fault because he won't take the serum. That's all. And that's a dangerous thing. It certainly is. You can't say the doctor was the cause of it, and you're right on his doorstep, won't take his medicine, and yet he's got something. Now, you say you believe in taking medicine? I believe in anything that helps the human race is godly. Amen. Certainly it is. Amen. Exactly it is. Tell me why we had the, what would we do today about these clinics and hospitals and so forth? Right. Certainly. I know there's some shut behind the door when I first started off, but where did it all go to? See? You've got to look at anything sensible. Anything, if, if medicine and hospitals are not a God or antichrist, burn them down and get them out of the country. That's right. Sure. Amen. But it's something to help you. Certainly. But they ain't a one of them can heal you. They ain't a medicine in the world. No doctor, if he is, he's a quack, he ain't a real doctor. If a doctor tells you they got a medicine that'll heal you, he don't know what he's talking about. Amen. Male brother says there's not a medicine in the world to heal you. 
said there's only one healer, that's God. We only claim to assist nature. As I've told you, if I cut my hand, fell dead right here. All the, the medicine in the country couldn't heal that knife cut. You say, no, you're dead. Well, let them just embalm my body and look natural for 50 years again. And put a shot of penicillin in me every day and everything else. And it'd never get any better. Put salve on it, sew it up, and give me all. It wouldn't do it. If it's made to heal the body, why don't it heal it? There it lays. You say, the life has gone out. That's right. Now, what's life? I'll tell you who God is. It's exactly right. God is the healer. A doctor can set a bone, but he can't heal it. What if I was cranking my car, broke my arm, and run and said, Hey, doctor, heal my arm right quick so I can go out and finish cranking my car. Can't get things started. He'd say, You need mental healing. That's right. He might set it, but he can't heal it. That's right. He can take a tooth out, but he can't heal the socket to come out of it. He can cut a pendic out of your side, but he can't heal a place he cut. Because there's no medicines that'll build cells, multiply cells. And before you can heal anything, it has to be a multiplication of cells. So God's the only healer. You can't make God's word wrong. Psalms 103, 3 said, I'm the Lord, heals all thy diseases. I've been interviewed at Mayo Brothers in many places, and they say that. We're not healers. We don't claim to be healers. We only assist nature. There's one healer, that's God. So God is the healer. Someone said to me not long ago, said, all right, Brother Van, I'm going to ask you a question then. So what about penicillin for flu? I said, well, my, my, I hope you ain't that weak. I said, look, what if you got a house full of rats eating holes all through the roof and everything and down everywhere there's a lot, you put out a lot of rat poison and poison the rats. It kills all the rats. That don't patch the holes. Penicillin only kills the germ, the flu germ. It doesn't build up the tissue it's tore down. It just poisons the rats. That's all. God has to patch the holes. That's all. He's the Lord that heals all of our diseases. Yes, sir. I thank God for every serum that they got. For the salt vaccine, pray constantly that God will give us something for cancer, for poor suffering people. Anything can do to help, I'm for it. Yes, sir, I'm 100% for it. And if we Christian people would pray more for such things as that, we'd be better off, the whole country would. Yes, great man, to give their lives, just trying to fight back at those things that cripple children and everything, certainly... I certainly thank God for everything He's done for us. I thank God for an automobile. I thank God for soap to wash my hands with. <laughs> all the mechanics, all those things, I thank God for them. Yeah. Certainly. There's one time we didn't have soap, you know. There's one time we didn't have an automobile. I thought I would walk over to Phoenix, I could take off, but I thank God for an automobile. I get in and trust Him right down the road as hard as I can go. See? So we thank the Lord for those things. All things that's good to help us comes from God. Certainly. But now, while the patient's sitting out on the doctor's steps and just refuses to take his medicine, and if the patient dies, it ain't the medicine's fault. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Then why is the health of my daughter, my people, not recovered? Is there something wrong? It's the same thing in the church. Men and women sit in the church and die of their sins. Because they refuse God's bomb. That's right. That's not because there's no bomb here. The Holy Spirit's here. We got plenty of doctors, <laughs> physicians. So the people dying their sins don't lay it on to God. There's a bomb in Gilead. And there's physicians there. But it's the people's attitude towards it. Now, if you, uh, if you take like medicine, it's a horrible thing if uh, you would uh, refuse medicine. How much more horrible is it if you refuse God's bomb for your soul? Refuse that toxin, then what's going to take place? You're lost forever if you refuse that. Oh, you, your body might patch around. And then another thing, you can take medicine. What's good for one or help one will kill another. Penicillin almost kills a third of what it helps. It'll kill some and help the others. It's a very dangerous thing. And what will help one will help them, but you don't have to worry about God's toxin. It helps whosoever will let him come. Yes, sir. It's for all. You don't have to worry about it. No danger of fooling with it. You go to fooling with it, you say, well, I tell you, Brother Branham, I, uh, I don't believe it's for me. Like people say today, I just can't keep from smoking. I just can't keep from running out. A man told me not long ago, he said, I got a good wife, but Brother Bram, I was, wasn't made for one woman. said, I, I got to run with other women. I said, you know what's the matter with you? You just refuse the remedy. 
That's all. That's what's the matter with the people today. Read your drink, smoke, lie, steal, and fuss with, carry on. You refuse God's bomb of love that draws us together and makes us one. Not because there's not enough power of God here to send a revival through the city. We just refuse to use it. That's all. Amen. Amen. It's, it's, it's here. But if you die in your sins, your unbelief, it's not God's fault. It's not the Holy Ghost's fault. It's not the church's fault. Just because people refuse it. They say heart trouble is number one killer. No, no. Sin trouble is number one killer. Right. Number one killer. It's got into our Pentecostal groups. A man was talking to me today about uh, the Pentecostal people. And he said, you know what, Brother Branham? It's getting to be just like it. I don't know why. He said, you know, a lot of our people, are, they have their children, they bring them out in, put them on the cradle roll, and come up. And that's the way they just expect it to be that way. As David the Priest has once said about such a thing as that, why, you can't get in like that. That's what, that's what made the Methodists what they are. That's, right. that's what made the Baptists what they were. They just kept bringing their children in, put them on the cradle roll, and bring them up. God don't have any grandsons. Lord, he just has sons. Sons and daughters, not grandsons and granddaughters. God don't have grandchildren. You ain't, you know, God, God ain't grandpa, he's father. Amen. I hope I don't hurt your feelings, but I hope I ain't scare you a little bit anyhow. Get something started. God don't have grandchildren. Amen. And when you just cause you were Pentecostal, your papa and mama paid the price, that don't make you Pentecostal, but you pay the same price and get the same thing they had. There's plenty of it left. <laughs> There's plenty of bomb in Gilead yet. Plenty of toxin there for sin, unbelief. Yes, sir. All the Pentecostal brethren raising up sin, denying divine healing and such things as that. It's just because you refuse the toxin, you right. grandson. <laughs> Not a son of God. A son of God is born of the Spirit of God. He's God's child, but God don't have any grandchildren. That's it. Right. Amen. You know what's the matter? They're afraid of the new birth. That's all the matter. Yeah. Let me tell you something, brother. I don't care what kind of a birth it is. Any birth is a mess. If it's in the pig pen, or if it's in the stable, or if it's in a pink decorated hospital room, any birth is a mess. Yeah. And the new birth is the same. It'll make you get out of the squall and ball and do things that you never thought you'd do before. It'll bring forth new life as sure as the word. It might mess up your theology. It might mess up your card parties. It might mess up your swimming and dancing and scroll skating. It might make you grow your hair. It might make you get something different. It's birth, life. It's messy. Let's get messy before it gets right. Yes, sir. You have to have, uh, except the corner wheat falls in the ground and rot. Messy. Get dirty with it. That's right. Just die out. Get down there. And the woman said to me one time, said, oh, I'd be ashamed. Them people down there said, I couldn't hear you even preach. Said, well, oh, them women and men hollering, hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord. I couldn't hear what you're saying. I said, if they didn't say it, it'd scare me to death. Yeah. <laughs> she said, when that woman got up back there and started crying, said, just shields run up my back. I said, if you'd ever get to heaven, you'd freeze to death. I said, the they are going to be screaming and shouting and praising the Lord. Right. What they're afraid of new birth. That's the reason you got grandchildren in the church. Pray to the new birth. Pray to the Holy Ghost. Pray to the power of God. Pray to, pray to make, wash some of the makeup off of you or something. That's what's the matter. God sent us an old time revival. Bring forth the Holy Ghost again. There's plenty of it. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physicians there? Sure, there's physicians here. Plenty of bomb here, too. Then why is the daughter of my people not recovered? It's because the people refuse it. Yes, amen. That's it. They refuse to come together. They refuse to have a revival. That's what's the matter. Selfishness and things take it over. There's plenty of bomb in Gilead. There's positions here. But the people refuse it. That's what's the matter. There was a time when we didn't have toxin for typhoid fever. The time we didn't have toxin for uh, the, the salt vaccine and stuff like that. And uh, But now we got it. 
Yeah. That's exactly. We got it now. Thank God for it. There was a time that our toxin uh, for salvation wasn't too good because it was lambs and things and goats. But now the toxin has been changed. All right. Certainly. When, why do they find remedies for medicine? You know what they do? They study up. Put so much of, of this in and so much of this in up antidote to, to, to kill the poison and so much and see the case of the patient and how strong is... You never take medicine unless you ask the real doctor about it because it'll kill you. And so then, and, uh, so then they find out and then the first thing you'll do is squirt it into a little guinea pig. If he survives it, then he'll give it to you. <laughs> And sometimes all human bodies are not made like guinea pigs, you know, and that's reason to kill some human beings. That's right. They give the little guinea pig the test, and if that little fellow makes it, then they give it to you. Yeah. Well, that's the way they test medicine. You know that's the truth. Sure. They find a certain thing and give it to the guinea pig, and if he survives it, then they give it to you. And that's the reason to kill a lot of patients, because that we're not all made like guinea pigs. But let me tell you something. When God tested his toxin... He never got a guinea pig. He took himself. Yeah. All right. Oh, God. All right, God. When he was baptized there by John on the banks of the Jordan, the inoculation come down from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. They watched it, see if it'll hold. When he spit in his face, it helped good. He reviled, he was reviled not back. When he died at Calvary, he prayed for his enemies. It held at Calvary. It held in death. It held on earth. It held everywhere. They put him in the grave, and on Easter morning, it held again. Yes. Amen. Amen. Uh, not a guinea pig, but a son of God. Yes. He took it himself. Yes. Amen. 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 Now I'm not getting really excited. I'm getting to feel religious. Who took the toxin? Who tested it? Oh, hallelujah. He was the one who took our sins and bore our sickness. Yes, he took the top seat on himself. Yes. Not only a guinea pig, prophet, or something or another, he put it on himself. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory, glory, yes, sir. Glory. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Just time our peace up on him and with his stripes, we are healed. Yes. It held in the hour of death. It held in the cross. It held in Gethsemane. Held under every temptation. Everything else, the top seat helped. Yes. Amen. Amen. God was going to try eternal life. And he put it in the human body of his own son coming and dwelt in him. And the toxin hell. When he rose up on Easter morning, he broke the bands of death, hell, in the grave. And come forth. He appeared to the eleven as he said, and they did them because of the hardness of their hearts and their unbelief because they believed not them and seen him after he had risen from the dead. Amen. Amen. Say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. For I'm going to give him some toxin. <laughs> if I give him this toxin, the things that I do, they'll do also. I'm going to inoculate the whole church with it. He said, All the world, these signs shall follow them to me. Hallelujah. These signs that I did, they'll do it also. Because I'm going to inoculate the church with the same toxin. Can you be baptized? Same toxin that I'm inoculated with? <laughs> That's what's your matter today. We took some old church creed for inoculation. That's the reason sin crept in. If we get that same spirit that's up on him, that same baptism, that same eternal, that same glory, that same Holy Ghost, he'll inoculate us just the same as inoculated him. Take all fear out. Yes. Hallelujah. Stand in the face of the enemy and call God's word the truth. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Give you a backbone like a saw log. Yes. Take the wishbone out and put a real backbone in it. Yes, yes it will. Can you be baptized with inoculation that I'm inoculated with? Certainly held in his life. When he spit in his face and say, You old Trinity, you old one. <laughs> no, no. No, it's not that. No, no. He was inoculated with the love of God. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believed in him should not perish. He was inoculated. Yes. A little virgin born body the God of heaven dwelt in. He was inoculated with God. Yes. Eternal life was his inoculation. And it helped in the time of temptation. Helped in a time of. of uh, when everybody forsaken him. Yes. It helped. Lord. Yes. <laughs> it stayed good. An enemy in the face of death, and they wanted that same inoculation because after being dead and in the grave for 
three days and nights when all the heavens blacked out, the earth I took a nervous prostration and all the, the rocks wrung out of the mountains and everything witnessed he was dead and he was in the grave. And on Sunday morning, the inoculation helped because he said, I have power to lay my life down and power to raise it up again. This inoculation I have will lay the life down and I'll pick it up again. Brother, that's what I want. I want to hold out my arm. You don't get it in the arm, you get it in the heart. Hold out for inoculation of the resurrection of the power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Inoculation. Now you don't want to write any creed over the top of here. Just let Christ come in. That's the inoculation. He never tried it with a creed. He's done it with his spirit. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physicians there? Oh, yes. We got both bomb and physicians. Then why? That's God's going to ask us why some of these days. Why? They want to get inoculated. So he said, I'll tell you what you do. You go up to the city of Jerusalem. And you climb up in that upper room and you stay there till your inoculation comes. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> stay until you're inoculated. Until the toxin comes down. The bomb comes down. And while we was all sitting together singing hymns in one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It inoculated 120 out there. My, what a running spell they had. Oh, my. Like branding a calf. I used to brand calf. Always felt sorry for the little fella. And I, I had to ride to bring the iron, and you Texans know what I'm talking about. And so they'd have him hog tied and grab this old iron over there and slap it on him. I mean, he'd have a spasm. He would kick and squall and carry on there for a long time, but brother, he know where he belonged from that on. He was grand. That's right. And sometimes it'll make you act like you don't have good sense, but you're branded. You know where you're at. You're right there. Inoculated. 120. Got inoculated. Oh, they were having them a time, what I mean to say. They were really getting a great time. Come out of there, all inoculated at eternal life, know that God would raise them up at the last days, and they were having a big time, and they're so full of glory. Many of them could speak in four, five, six, seven, eight, ten different languages, yes. but they couldn't even find one of them to use to praise him with, so they just, God give them a brand new language to praise him with. Lord. So they just started speaking in unknown tongues as the Spirit give them others. Just have it, just inoculated. That showed they had been inoculated. <laughs> they were they were speaking of a kingdom where they'd gone to. Yeah. They was inoculated. Yeah. Sin question was over. Peter wouldn't have quite weep bitterly anymore. It was all over then. He was inoculated. Yes, sir. And you know what? Some of them people got so hungry for some of that. You know what they did? They said, Man and brethren, what can we do? They got a doctor here? Yep. What is this? This is a bomb. Got a doctor here? Yes. His name is Dr. Simon Peter. Oh. All right, Peter, will you write us a prescription? Yes. I don't want to be writing this all the time. I'm just going to write one for all the time. <laughs> I'll write you a prescription. Now listen, brother. You know what? If the prescription's wrote out right, don't you know take it to one of these quack drug stores and put a little bit to it or add a little bit or take away from it? If you put anything different in it and mix that formula, it'll kill your patient. Yes. Yes. If you take too much of the antidote out, put too much antidote in, it won't do a bit of good. Amen. So just leave it the way it's wrong. Yes. He said, what kind of prescription? He said, repent every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this prescription is for your children and your children's children. And Repent and get right with God. Take away all the things God promised that He'd give you the Holy Ghost. That's the prescription. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents and bring other things, they not harm them. For they are not There's plenty of inoculation. Hallelujah! Oh!
death. Come down in the face of St. Paul one time this, building a scaffold, cut his neck off there at Rome. I stood at the same place. Paul said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? I've been inoculated. Hi, you're holy. Hi, you're speak back to me. Thanks be to God who sent a bomb for Gilead and inoculated my heart with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Injected into my life, injected into your life, and then comes down and energizes it with his presence. Oh my! You know, usually when you take a serum, every once in a while you're inoculated, but you have to get a booster. And what this city needs in a Pentecostal church today is a booster. Don't boost it on and say we'll make a few more organizations. That'll ruin your prescription. Go right back and take a booster of the very same thing. That's coming out of the same place. The same baptism of the same prescription and the same Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Holy is forever and ever. The glory is power in the resurrection. And he said, the things that I do shall you do also because you've been inoculated. Amen. Inoculated with resurrection power. I know you think of noisy, but my, you felt the way I did to get noisy. Calculated. Branded. So glad I know where I belong. In the house of God. Aren't you glad, Christians? Oh, he's here. Oh, beyond the shadow of God. Let's bow our heads and worship him. Lord Jesus. Oh, God, your spirit is so rich and how rich and pure. It shall forevermore endure saints and angels song. The love of God that reaches across the peace, that goes to the depths, that reaches out for the fallen. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Lord, we've got bomb. We've got inoculations. We've got physicians here that can read the prescription. God, you're here as a druggist to fill it and give the inoculation. I pray, God, that you'll grant it to every heart tonight that's indifferent towards Christ. Grant it. Let your great spirit come forward now and show its power. Grant it. As I lay myself across these handkerchiefs, aprons, a little cloths, may the Holy Ghost just bring in this joy of the springs of life into this church. Oh, God, may it sweep you every one of these little cloths. In the name of Jesus Christ, may they each be blessed and the people be healed. I commit them to you, Lord, with the audience. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen and amen. Oh, my. How, how glad I am. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Oh. Mm. When I used to, oh, I was a game board and I passed through. There used to be a little old spring. It was the happiest spring I ever seen. It just bubble, bubble, bubble all the time. Summertime, wintertime. One day I sat down beside a little old spring and I said, uh, What are you so happy about? Of course, he couldn't answer me. And I thought, Now, if he could answer me, what would he say? I said, You're happy because deers drink from you? Nope. I said, Why are you bubbling about because bears drink from you? Nope. Do you bubble because I drink from you? Nope. I said, What makes you bubbling all the time? If he could talk, he'd say, Brother Branham, it ain't me bubbling, it's something behind me bubbling me, pushing me. And that's the way it is with a born again son of God. It's been inoculated by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not me that doeth the works, said Jesus. It's the Father that dwells in me. He's the one that does the works. It's not this, if somebody here that don't understand it, it's not these people bubbling, it's something down there bubbling them up. <laughs> that's right. Grushers, guys, you're spraying it up. He told the woman at the well. Waters to be a fountains of water. 
bursting up into everlasting life. Hallelujah. Oh, no wonder the poet said it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I feel twice my size. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm home now. I'm glad. I'm glad that we have come out. Aren't you happy? Amen. Oh, my, what God could do with this little group right now. What he can do if he can ever get one person in his grip is so he can hold that one person. He can, he can put 10,000 to flight with that one person. If well, one person in genuine faith, he can put 10,000 devils running as hard as they can go. Yes, Amen. I am so glad, aren't you? We used to sing a little song when I first come into Pentecostal people and say, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Certainly, he was all bound down to give you inoculation. <laughs> that did it. That's all it took. Amen. I love him. I love him. Remember, friends, I love you. The night will get too dark, the rain too fall, will fall too thick, but while I do anything for you could, just remember I'm your brother. I love you with all my heart. Any prayer card to give out? Uh, anybody got a prayer card? Oh, I forgot. Well, there's no need to call them one. <laughs> all right, we don't have to. God will heal just the same. You believe in inoculation? You believe that Jesus made a way through his blood, that he could put his serum into a believer, and that believer with that same serum in him, it'll do the same thing it did in the next man. It'll do air. Oh, he's wonderful, isn't he? The works that I do shall you also. All right, you people out there, if God will testify now, how many is sick? Let's see your hands. Wants help from God? Just raise up your hand. Right? Oh, isn't he? Isn't he just joy unspeakable and full of glory? Now, let's just be as reverent as we can for a few minutes and just look to him now. Don't you just have showers of blessing? We shall have showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now the refreshing. Don't you like that, that refreshing, that life? Brother, sister, I want to tell you something. I want you to believe me as I speak in the name of the Lord and say, Thus saith the Lord. There's only one thing can heal you, and that's God. Amen. And the only one route you can come to him by, that's by faith. Is that right? Right. Now, we know we believe in laying on hands. Don't you believe that? But if you bear with me, you've always wondered. People say, 
Brother Bram, Oral Roberts prayed for 500 while you're praying for five. I know it. That's right. Or Roberts prays for him the way God told him to do. I pray the way God helped me to do. Amen. So he, he, God, he obeys God, and I do too. But you see, Or Roberts and those brothers there laying hands on, if you'll bear with me, that's a Jewish custom. It wasn't so with the Gentiles. Look at the, uh, the priest. He said, come lay your hand on my daughter, and she, she'll get up. She'll be all right. You'll come lay your hands on her. That's Jewish. Lay hands on her. But when he comes to the Roman centurion, he said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my house. Just speak the word. What did he recognize? That Jesus had power over all sickness. He said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a centurion. Uh, that's a hundred men. A century is a hundred men. I say to this and go do this, and he does it. I say this would come, and he comes. Because he asked you, I'm over you. What did he say so much? I know that you're over every sickness, every disease. Just speak the word. That's all he had to do. What did Jesus say? He turned around and said, I never saw faith like this in Israel. Now, we want to have on a higher ground, don't we? Healing has already been done at Calvary. Now, if God will bring at least two to three people in this audience tonight that I don't know anything about and will show that what I have preached to you is the truth. If you'll prove that I've told you the truth, now just shut yourself in just a moment. You say this, Lord Jesus, the man don't know me. Now there's about two or three people that I know out there. I know brother and sister Evan sitting here, and this is their two daughters sitting right here. And then brother Softman, brother Fred Softman there, is one of the trustees in my church in Jeffersonville. And I think Brother Simpson, that's he and his wife, and Brother and Sister Simpson sitting right next to them. They're back this way up here. Now, I just want to look at the audience just a moment. I want you to believe with all your heart. Oh, you don't know how that... I just felt it strike me just saying. See, I, I know what's going to happen. That's the thought. God's promised it. His promises is true. Would you believe it? Believe me as his servant. Wonderful. Uh, I was telling you the other day about standing in Indian over them thousands of us. I had to swear it was. You got it right in your hand. God, Thank give it right over. I take every spirit under, you, under my own control for the glory of God. Oh, what could just happen now? See, we rejoice. That's the joy of God. That's the joy of our salvation. Is that right? You see, David never lost his salvation. He said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He had his salvation, but he lost his joy. Well, we got plenty of joy. We know that. We have joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. God. But now, the thing, the power of God is something greater than joy. Power comes by settled faith. We can have a lot of joy, but maybe we wouldn't have no power in there to heal at all. But when we have, we have the power of God, then we got the faith of God that moves up. Takes hold of God, knows how to touch Him. Hallelujah. I just be praying. I'm watching for you. If He should touch me, then I know. Anybody here that was in one of the meetings? I see your hands. There was in one of the meetings before. One man, two men, three men, four, five, that's good, six, six people. Never was in it before. Now, I want to tell you something, brother. How did Jesus recognize, how did the world recognize Jesus as Messiah? Because that he could tell them who they were or what they were. Or when Simon Peter came up, just an old fisherman, he said, Thou art Simon, you're the son of Jonas. Peter believed him. When he come to, well, we just went all through the Bible. Last night we take exactly it. Up in the tree, blind Barnabas, when he touched him, turned around and told him. The woman at the well, she told her where her trouble was, and she said, Come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Amen. He never did it unto any of the Gentiles. Glory. It only went to the Jews and the Samaritans because they're looking for a Messiah. Now, there are long 2,000 years of wandering in darkness, but now the Gentiles have had their days of training, and now they're sifting the church now. It's come down to the end. Just as it was there in 4,000 years, and then there in, now it's 2,000 years because he's just taken a, a people, not a nation, just a people out of the Gentiles for his name's sake. Amen. They'll have his name, see. 
namesake, he takes the people from the Gentiles. But they have taken Israel by a nation. But he's the same Christ. And he promised, as it was the days of Lot, the thing he did, he'll do it again. How many would like to believe that that angel of God, that that one that met Lot, met uh, Abraham, he never went down to Lot, he stayed with Abraham. You know, have you read the story now many times? Now this two of them went down to Lot. And one of them, they got them out. But this one never went out, and that was the one that was the Lord God, Elohim. And he had his back turned to the tent. First he looked to Abraham and asked Abraham where his wife was, Sarah. Said she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'll visit you according to life, time of life, the 28 days. Again, she's 100 years old then. Right at 90. She's 90. Abraham was 100. He said, and she laughed. He said, why did she laugh? I said, that would repeat again. I'll just do it both ways. See if it's the same God. Now, may God of heaven, and look with this Bible. Let me say this, Christians. This Bible over my heart. Got a little unbelief slipping around. One come in last night, set up on the edge of the platform, heard the meeting. God will take care of that. Thought I didn't know it. <laughs> but you never think that, brother. Let me say this from the Bible of my heart. I do this not for a show. I do this because it's to fulfill what Jesus said would take place. When he come, he didn't have to heal. He did it that it might be fulfilled. Is that right? This don't have, you don't have to do this, but it might be fulfilled. He promised it. It's his word. And so he just permits it because of the fulfilling of his word. God heal heart trouble? He did then, didn't he? It's all over now. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I never seen a woman in my life. But she's healed now. Has that fulfilled his word? Well, you say, Brother Branham, what does that fulfill? He's a high priest that can be touched for the healing of our infirmities. Is that right? Well, I thought you said he was El, El Elohim. That's right. Well, you said he had his back turned and he found out what Sarah was doing correctly. Now you say, are you him? No, sir. That's him all over this building. See? That's him and you. It's him and me, but he has to work through somebody. Is none of us worthy. We couldn't be worthy. We're sinners, but he just chose us. I believe we were at gifts and callings or without repentance. Amen. I believe that God chose us before the foundation of the world. His church. Do you believe that? Yes. The Bible says so. Yes. Right? And that Christ would deceive all upon the earth whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. Pray out in here somewhere. Pray and see. All brethren, it's coming from you too. Thank you. Now you just pray with me. We'll see where that same angel is. Now just take your time, be reverent. We just take our time. We've got plenty of time. Just don't be in no hurry. Don't be pressing. Just sit still say, Lord God, that man's got his back turned to me, and I know he's just a man. So if, if he didn't know me, he'd have to be you telling him. That's all there is to it, because I'm just a stranger sitting at this meeting here. Yes, there's a woman appears to me right here now. I'm looking right at her. I want you, brother, to look here. Can't you see it? Look here, right at the edge of this cloth here. See this red? Here. Look here, that light. There's a woman sitting right in behind me. She's very upset. She has arthritis. And she has high blood pressure. She's bothered with an allergy. And... Well, she's just got complications. Now, she just don't miss it when I turn. Her name is Miss Khan. Stand up, Miss Khan. Receive your healing. Now, 
How do you believe? Have faith in God, then. Abraham, where is your wife Sarah in the tent behind you? You see what I mean? What about some of the rest of you? Can it happen to you? Can it be a believer? This little woman sitting right here. She had light just above there. Look here. She looked up at me and she's praying. She's not praying for herself, it's for her son. It's what she's asking for your son, wasn't it, lady? You believe God can tell me what's his trouble? Will you accept the healing for him? Stomach trouble. That's right. Just believe it. That's all. What about somebody over in this district? What do you all believe over there? You believe with all your heart? Have faith. Just believe. How many over here sick and don't have a prayer card? Just begin to melt into you now. You want prayer, but you haven't got a prayer card. Well, nobody's got a prayer card, of course. That's right. I believe said there's one prayer card here somewhere, probably from a meeting or something. If everybody just had faith, now I trust. If thou canst believe. Right here, look here at you here in the front row. That hurting you, believe God will make it well. Believe it with all your heart. You can have what you've asked for. What about you, mistress? Your head down here. Past door the woman. Jump right straight in there with me. You're needy too, aren't you? You believe in Christ to make you well? You got trouble with your eyes, with your ears. You're from Houston, Texas. Mr. West, go back and tell him that Houston Christ healed the sick. You believe with all your heart now? had a nervous breakdown, have you, lady? You can Carpus Christus there. Believe with all your heart. God's a healer of all afflictions. You believe with all your heart? Put your hand up over there a while ago, mister, with that liver trouble and stomach trouble. Mr. Rainwater from over in Louisiana. <laughs> First time he's ever in a meeting, I think you put your hand up. What do you think about it? Is he a wonderful healer? Go back and tell him over there what he can do for you. All over here. <laughs> Sitting back there in the back. That little boy. Got a mental block, has he? It was caused from a doctor done something to him. Too much anesthetic. Give him a mental block. If I tell you who you are, will you put your hand on that boy for me? Miss Howe? That's right. Put your hand on the boy. I'll condemn that devil. Satan? Come out of him in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask for his healing. Do you believe? Does everybody believe? Is God here? Is this the inauguration? Is this the same Holy Spirit? The same Lord Jesus? The one that was promised? How many of these believers raise your hand? Hallelujah. Let's put your hands on one another and do just as I can now. I'll be real quiet. Put your hands on one another. I got something now. You're just fine. This is the minute. All right. Now, I'm going to say the prayer. Surely I know what will take you to defeat your enemy now. I'm going to put words in your mouth and you repeat them back from your heart. You pray. I'm going to say it. Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, forgive my sins of unbelief. 
and give to me of thy mercy. I believe in thee. I accept thee as my Savior, my only salvation. I need your strength for my health. I cannot go farther without you. I now accept you as my healer. I renounce the devil and all of his work. From this time henceforth, I will think positive. I will believe every promise. The scripture that says, by his stripes, I was healed. I now accept it. I believe it. It is mine. I thank you, Lord. I will continue testifying of my healing until I'm perfectly well. Now, now hold still. Keep your hands on one another now. Now you pray. Now shut yourself in with God. Go see something happen now. All right, brethren. Ministers. Everybody, are you ready? Now, if God will hear my prayer here, he hears it anywhere. Now, you've prayed. You've made your confession, just like you would come in as a Christian. You're ready now. If you was a sinner, you're ready for baptism. Now, being that you are a Christian, you've made your confession, and now you're ready for healing. Now, what does it take? Now, God's ready to give it to you. There's just one thing above you. That's a little thin shadow of doubt. Now, if we can break through that, just like a great airplane, they tell me these jet planes, if they just struggle and wiggle and struggle and wiggle till they get through that sound barrier, but as they run through the sound barrier, then they're free. Now, if you can just rise yourself above that little, little doubt barrier there, oh, brother, what will take place? You'll run free. You'll be healed. Now, I want you to be real reverent, hold your hands on one another, and keep shutting with Christ now, like nobody's around you but Him. And just imagine in your heart, now you see him come walking right down to you, standing right in front of you. Now open your heart and let him in while I pray and cast away this little shadow of darkness over you. And when it breaks, you're out of sound barrier then. Just rise and give him praise. Every time when you feel your soul pass through that unbelief, then you're free in Christ. Heavenly Father, thanking you for all that you have done, for the many healings, for the great power of God. For the many has been saved, for the fellowship of the ministers, and above all things, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. You have not failed us one time, but has told us the truth every time. Confirmed your word with signs and wonders following. And now, Father, this little group has staggered out through this slick robes and rains tonight to come here to see Jesus. We've seen you. we felt you. We know you're here. We've got your word in our hearts. They've confessed. They've openly, publicly confessed that they believe and have accepted you as their healer. Now their souls are struggling, Lord, to get through that little barrier there, that little thing out of the shape of them. Wonder if it could be me. Wonder if they'll be lost. No, Lord. May the power of Jesus Christ raise them up right now. Break away that barrier. Satan, 